be a scorch. And uh, here a student had dried his, sometimes we often collect the sticks and we find that if we wait too long, these tips dry out. So he probably lashed them and dried them and, and bent them back um, to uh, put them together later. Uh, my demonstration of the many options I have here will be the one that you would have done from a crawling position wallowing in waist deep snow so your snowmobile had broken down about uh, 300 kilometers over that, in that direction. That is, uh, I simulated the fact that uh, you cannot wander around very much trying to find your materials uh, at, for the first uh, pair of snowshoes at any rate. But when you are into a training situation, it sometimes uh, speeds up the, the, the uh, business of training by making a really nice pair of snowshoes the first time around and then after that learning how to make your snowshoes out of the worst possible materials if that's all you've got. Here I had sticks and I'm going to, since this is my last snowshoe for a little while here, I'm going to take uh, and build one nice one by some, uh, having uh, picked up out of the tin that I have here. Normally you start with 10 sticks because you have 10 fingers. There was a guy here, he only had 11, had nine fingers. <laughs> so uh, he could, if he wished on that side, he could have four sticks and the outside five. Uh, this is all, in, in a lot of the things we do, you, you must really work hard to tell people that there's a certain precision that wastes time. <laughs> if you're measuring everything very carefully, you're, you're, you don't you waste the time. If sticks are crooked, you put them on the outside, but that one is too thin almost. And this one is probably more like the thickness because birch is soft. That one looks good and nice and straight. And that one. That one has a fork in it with the judgment that should the fork have been trimmed, it might have weakened the stick in the part that wants to bend, so you leave the fork on there. This one is not too bad. Now, also, ideally, if you build a snowshoe a little narrower, uh, then it acts like a ski anyway. And if you make it tall enough, past the end a little, so that you can lay on it and use it as your sleeping platform, that if you're careful in the thickness, these, these sticks are the perfect thickness for creating the resilient platform that you sleep on. So if you lay two sticks down, that are uh, as well, the wide as your shoulders, like one there and one there. You put a stick down on here, and if this stick is at the neck and this stick is at the back of the leg, right here, at the back of the leg, then a finger thick stick will uh, have enough resistance to give you a bounce. But if you put that cross part at the heel and at the head, then the sticks will bend until they touch the ground, if you know what I mean. Normal person doesn't realize you don't need any resiliency under your neck or actually from just beyond your hips. And they build a, 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 a mattress always their full size, which is uh, not, you know, it's a bigger, much bigger challenge and a much uh, greater waste of time. There's these drink, I need two more reasonable sticks and we'll make a real nice snowshoe, perhaps to, uh, uh, and you can see here that this individual, actually it looks artistic, but he would get a definite passing grade because he could have probably built these right for the very first shrub pump he found. <laughs> Didn't let him deter that it wasn't perfection. I built snowshoes that, uh, you know, were uh, very, very handsome, very good looking, and, but I spent a little time, you know, when you want to impress the general, I guess you've got to really spend a little time uh, getting the nicest sticks you can find. But that luxury is not available to you all the time. Mm. That one is crooked. Was, I guess that's going to have to do. When you have selected your sticks, you first fix your attention on this end. And that end in the peeled stick, generally, if it's close to being a pencil, pencil stick after it's peeled, it's going to be ideal. You're always working between these limits of something being too light or too heavy, too small or too big, too crooked or too straight, too either or. There's always a magic figure and it takes quite a few years of training to be able to zero in. You know, how do you select a pot that's perfect? That's neither too big nor too small, neither, neither this, neither that, and in the end, you realize as you use it, you have something that is worth um, and that is, is very valuable because of, its, it, it, of, of how well it's been chosen. Here now that we have gotten the pieces, they might not be exactly perfect in length, but it's easier to cut the small ends off than the thick ends, and you set the thick ends on. And if they are crooked, well, you put them to the side, but it doesn't matter in the end. There are certain things that do matter, and the things that are obvious that seem to matter to a person are not the ones that really matter. And we have here parachute shroud line, and we have nylon cord. We will use parachute shroud line because it is available to you. It's getting more and more expensive where I come from. 
and generally in order to make things convenient cut it this long and then it won't drive you crazy because it's too long in some cases you will find that the lashing is easier to do when the strings are removed I removed the strings out of this one but it's not a necessity <coughs> because when you have all the strings in there the cord is so bulky that when you're trying to put on real severe strong cutting lashing it's hard to do because of the bulkiness of the cord and the stiffness of the cord and there's a knot here that's called the jam knot and you'll just have to go on belief I tie a, a knot in the end and the jam knot is actually a slip knot so I make a slip knot here that would choke a rabbit there it is right there two knots on the same string I made it big enough that I can pass over the toes in this instant but you can't do that all the time and then I'm lashing over there won't be able to do it there and here when I go to tighten right off the bat the two knots will bump up against each other this to me there are seven knots that I use all the time in survival this knot takes up at least probably seven parts of the importance and the other six knots have to share the other three parts of importance because of its universal usage here and when I go to tighten this I, I I can tighten it very 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 tightly but I also have to set myself up beforehand to lock it so it won't come loose and I did that by by flipping the knot over and now I tighten and I might tighten hmm, something this not paying attention I should go a little bit further down there's a fork here that will embarrass me later okay yeah and you if, if I was to train people I would forget all of the other knots and make sure they could tie this one with their eyes closed with their eyes, with their eyes blindfolded many things there's this steps in training for the field for the person who's in in, in operation that this is obvious but a lot of people end up doing it they don't put it into words you got to know what you're doing and after you know what you're doing you got to get good at it and if you're good at it you got to become fast and after you're fast you got to be able to do it without the use of your eyesight and then when you can do it without the you strip a rifle like that would you be a superior soldier <laughs> take your rifle apart by eyesight in the dark clean it and put it together again take your watch apart put it together again and then finally the final requirement is you have to also know the, when to quit that's an important one there's some in between someday that will work there we are we're at the stage now if you want to tie the toes back and if you're in a rush you don't because you're making a ski shoe and you're skiing with it now they're together now I want to know where to put my foot on this arrangement and I put it ahead of the balance point if I find the balance point and if my foot my heel is ahead of this balance point I'm going to attach my snowshoe here means that whenever I lift my foot this is so heavy that the toe will come up to take the forward step all good snowshoes are constructed like that but a learner might not be aware of that hey. What is all these flying things today? Okay, where am I here again? I'll put a piece of string here to make it visible for me. The marker. Since I only know one knot today, it will be the jam knot. Tie a knot in the end, and with that, tie another knot. If you want to build a stretcher, you want to build a pack frame, a saw frame, almost anything, the, uh, the jam knot will be the knot that will get the job done. <coughs> And there's so many variations of the knot after you get good with it that it's a small book. There, that's my balance point roughly. <coughs> now, I can I have a choice here. I could use boards that I have carved out, but that takes time. I could choose to use sticks. If I have boots, I might use one stick because the heavy sole of the boot will tolerate it. If I have soft sole shoes, I may have to make three boards and carve them flat so I won't hurt my foot. Now we're in a rush today, so we're not going to uh, make it mo make more than one one stick, and we'll make our point. You'll only learn so much by watching me. All I am trying to achieve here is impress you with what you'll need to know, and you might say, hmm, that sounds like such a good idea, I'm going to get good at it. You may never have known about it. 
and so on. And in a snow environment, it might be just the type of... of uh, I'm cutting notches at least in the end sticks so that the string will not slip off the end. One notch to help. doesn't matter where, as long as the, skin stinks, uh, the, the stick will engage. If I make a pair of snowshoes to last a long time, I start with five sticks, and they lash twice. I tie the jam knot twice at each intersection. That's obviously 20 knots and 21 for each snowshoe. That's 42 knots. If I'm in a rush, the only time I may use two is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In nine knots, I would be ready to go. There's always that consideration that you want to build a snowshoe to use it for an hour or two and you're out of the trouble. You don't want to tie any more knots than you have to. Or you're going to build a snowshoe, now you're going to travel 200 kilometers on it. You're going to find it's going to be worthwhile to make sure that you cut <coughs> a lot more knots so that you're not rebuilding it again and again and again. You always got time to do it. never got time to do a thing right the first time. But you always got time to do it over and over again. Spread it out. Take the heaviest stick that you can find or the heavier sticks and put them under the sole of your foot and the lighter ones can go to the edge. It doesn't, the jumble over there doesn't matter too much. Put your foot down and I prefer about two fingers ahead of the heel and I put it where it's comfortable on the ball of my foot. And then I proceed to lash. Here's the string I cut off. Tie a knot in the end. This first stick I will lash with two jam knots. And the first time I tie the jam knot, I allow the magic cross to happen, the magic crossing of the stick when you tie tightly. If you hold the stick there and you lash it, let go of it, the stick will flip over that way. Why not lash it there and when you push it over like this, it'll make the lash even tighter. Don't fight things. By the time you've lashed a pair of snowshoes and you have the right sort of person guiding you, you'll have a tremendous philosophy of how to live. So, oh. try to get the knot off the top of the stick because your boot, or your, your if it's a soft sole shoe, it'll, it'll bother you. If it's a boot, it might wear the knot out. And the knot has decided it wants to stay, so I'll knock it over. Now, lock it. Now, the next knot will make it go 90 degrees. When you learn to make your first snowshoes, then after that you can adopt many other approaches. But this is the basic fundamental one. You can do very well in getting very good at doing it this way. Generally, if I wasn't talking, and if I was in a race in the spruce forest, where I look around and I say, I think there's a lot of nice sticks here for a snowshoe, and someone says, go, I will have completed a functional pair of snowshoes, including the peeling of the sticks, within the hour. It should take 60 seconds to peel a spruce stick like that with your knife, as a measure of your ability to be fast. Now here there is a notch that I cut. I happen to flip the board over, but that does not matter. You'll find there are many things that don't matter and many things that do. And using this knot, I will lash a pair of snowshoes for a very small amount of strength compared to trying to follow the traditional. You get in lots of trouble with this business of your mind imagining something. When we say blanket, for example, you know what a blanket is. Usually it's made of wool, and usually you put it over your shoulders, or you sleep under it. And then you say survival blanket, and you, st and you still keep thinking in the same way. This is not a blanket, this is a reflector. This has no substance, it has so little substance, it packs into a very tiny kit, and if it's used like a blanket, it will not improve the situation, it will eventually make it worse. You can't use it as a blanket, you've got to watch that you're not fooled. When I say bow, a person thinks of a bow for a bow and arrow. And a bow for a bow and arrow doesn't work as well with a bow drill. Here I'm only doing one lash at a time because we are making a fast snowshoe. And besides that, this particular knot I'm tying, I am now tying it for probably uh, 
780 string that is slightly elastic, works the best, but you can use it on, on anything. There is very few knots that will tie as elegantly and as tightly. And then on top of that, try to sleep on a, on a regular snowshoe after you've walked on it all day. You try to ski with a regular snowshoe. This is half ski, half snowshoe with, in its peeled form. But in a crusty snow out there, you might choose to build a very small snowshoe with three sticks or two sticks. That will keep you on top of the crust instead of you breaking through. And so a three-stick snowshoe will take a lot less time and if it's only you know, light enough that you hardly know that it's on your feet. So then I go straight across and make a neat bind. There's one there already. And uh, now cutting the notches is, is, is difficult. The person who uses a knife a great deal will use a baton most of the time. Any stick, you know, whenever we want to say something complicated, we say in French, baton. Baton. And they, <laughs> some French people here, I guess. We have the French Canadians between each stick. Just like the space of a finger is the best space for a fire, and that the, and that the uh, logs should all be parallel to each other. But when they supply stove wood, what can you do? This one? Oh, all right. Now we're going to find out what it's like to take this stick over there. Talk about other things. The heel board could be the same width as the snowshoe or just under the heel. Two lashes, one, two. And again, you saw, no, well, the first group didn't. I mean, you didn't, I guess the first group did. Now you have a toe loop. You've got very, you could even use parachute trout line for this if you were wearing uh, strong, heavy boots, but if you're wearing moccasins or something. The point of what footwear you wear in a snowshoe is important. And I'll tell you one of the probably the most functional pieces of information in the winter when your feet are freezing. You will never freeze your feet as badly, or if ever, if you've got two pairs of wool socks and you walk in the snow and the ice on the coldest day. The colder it is, the better. Two pairs of wool socks will work. Three pairs, and you're looking at probably the most superior winter footwear that you've ever worn. So if you're worried about your feet freezing and you're all over the enthusiastic, talk loud and fast, there it is. You create a toe loop, you put an elastic. In the survival kit for compactness, you have a choice. Either carry adequate lampic to make, this is about probably enough, that is two pieces of, of material of this nature. The parachute just uses, trims the bottom of the parachute off and they've got a ribbon like that there. And you use a piece that long and a piece this long to lash on one snowshoe. Or you use that little short piece plus an elastic to lash on a snowshoe. Put the elastic on your foot, put it in here, tie your toe loop with a reef knot on top. This method I'm using here, sometimes you don't have as much lamp and you just one use loop, but this one here allows you to automatically at the same time tie on your toe and set yourself up that your foot will not slide forward towards the tip. Then you take the elastic. Very important in snowshoes, in my estimation, but you can do whatever you like, because I ain't going to be there when you're suffering. <laughs> it's not going to be me that suffers if you don't want to listen to me ever. Mother Nature is a terrible instructress. She'll give you the exam first, and then the lesson after, if you're still alive, to appreciate it. And uh, you must be able to disengage yourself from a snowshoe without having to ever even try to reach and cut it with your knife. Because there are many instances where we might tie this toe back. We generally find, well, here I should use a, another knot called the constrictor. The constrictor is very useful for choking kittens and puppies and we want to get rid of them. Because it is very effective and you can't change your mind very easily after it. It's funny. <laughs> the constrictor is the knot I use an awful, awful lot. You go back there, and then the easiest way, you tie it back to the stick, unless there's nails there, you keep pulling the stick forward. So we make two prussics. And again, the student is exposed to another application of knots. And then you draw the toe up. The toe is not necessary if your snowshoe is not a ski shoe, ski snowshoe. That is, if you purposely left your skis rough 
and unpeeled and so on because you're going up and down so many hills, then you don't. There's, sometimes you purposely do not peel your stick on account that you want traction. But there are many circumstances where generally, um, I would say most people who are familiar with skis will always choose skis above snowshoes, but you can't build skis so easily out here uh, without the tools and the time in the emergent situation. There, now we have a, an arrangement here that will grip without moving. And we often get the assistance of another tree, and you bend the toes. That is, you find a tree, stick it there, and keep pushing the bottom till that happens. Being a, an advanced type of instructor, at least I, I am, I think I am, I can do it without the help of the tree. And then you parbuckle, which is the method you use in many applications in tying down things. I could only see what I was doing with these things. A native person who has lived in the forest by this time oh, sure. has lived in the forest as long as I have around the campfire will be blind just from the smoke of the fire. And that's, I'm afraid I, I feel that that's my problem these days. And you tie it back. When the, when the, when the uh, uh, tree, when it dries in a day or two, you will generally remove the string because you can put the string to use in other ways and you'll find that the string will often catch in the shrubbery. Yeah. Now that it, we have found that it comes back around, well, drives you crazy the elasticity of that. Right. <laughs> ah, okay, there. <laughs> if a stick breaks, it break keep you from breaking through the crust. It would be a very small stick. So we're on the thin ice and get away from the enemy, at least until they say, holy cow, look how he did it. In an hour, they're following you, at least they got an hour. <laughs> Any questions? It's the size. If it's a little large, you can fire, dress it down with a rasp and so on. Uh, now, uh, probably this thick, thumb thick, and then the rest of the tree, but the trees here grow kind of, uh, kind of squat. Uh, a standard stick, you have to as a trainee, you usually you'll have to eventually uh, appeal the stick in less than 60 seconds. I don't know, I'm out of practice. I uh, get it going. And I have never peeled a tree in, in uh, Swedish Lapland before, so we don't know. We've got more than 20 seconds. Now, before, too, it helps to rub the sticks. So, uh, now, a peeled stick will be much lighter. There is probably half a kilo of water in here. And by morning, it'll be dry. And when that stick dries, it'll be tougher and springier. You leave the bark on for many purposes, and it bends more and more and more and gets softer and softer, and you might not want that. So we get into that. Now, when you're peeling the, the stick, you learn that you must develop a certain speed. And even in this environment, you probably, within the hour, would have a functional pair of snowshoes. And if you were intent on using them more as a ski, you would even take the time. That would include the peeling. Which means for you got ten sticks. For hard work and serious professional work, you must learn to hold it very, very tightly. Uh, it's only for very delicate work that you can put the thumb on the back and do anything because you do not have the power that you have when you wrap your fingers around. And when you go on a stick and go like this, you learn to ride your knife and move very fast. And the reason is not to show off. But you must move fast to cut through the knots. Because if you go up to the knot slowly, you go on your dog and you cut and it slows you. So you, you generally, and you use many slices, an experienced person will peel a stick fast and cleaner than the inexperienced person who leaves a lot of bark on it. And that's a very fundamental, simple skill, which actually is the step towards feathering, which means taking wood and making it very fine for fire lighting. Because this gives you the idea of the control and doesn't have that, that sweet action. So, uh, generally in knife use, to be a, a serious soldier, if I'm going to talk to soldiers, I think you must apprentice for quite a while. That is, I would say probably work with a knife for about 
eight hours a day for a week. Uh, it takes me uh, at least three days before I feel comfortable with the students. It's a little late to be learning how to swim. It's a little late to be starting to really learn to use a knife when you're when you're into a, ser a serious uh, survival episode. And you have to work at it. And we have many ways. We make folk toys. We, we, uh, by the time we build a pair of snowshoes, if it doesn't matter, then you'll see that the knife goes through a lot easier. And uh, <coughs> hit it wrong because I, I wish I had a straighter stick. I just got that for an excuse. But, uh, yeah. uh, usually, uh, if you don't cut through, you, you find that that uh, in, in tent making, uh, tent pegs, and so on, in, in sharpening sticks. Now I have a baton I can cut hair with. A lot of people don't realize that the baton, the Mura knife, is very good for giving haircuts. <laughs> that is, w with proper training, you will begin to realize that when you use the word survival, you're implying someone who has reduced their dependence on tools to the point where the tools they're using are virtually invisible. I mean, the more skilled you are, you may not even have to use a knife. But it's very useful to be properly dressed and have a, a well-chosen knife that is a bush knife, not the figment of the imagination of some designer who lives in, uh, in, in <laughs> well, probably lives on Mars or something. But, it, but the situation is that, uh, in our experience, a well-trained person doesn't need, need no other tool. You'll survive winter, summer, fall, fleet be gone around. And usually by that time, the weight of the tree will cause it to fall. And some people will say, well, what's the big deal? You'll never have to, <laughs> well, you can never tell. I have a, a couple of purposes where I have to do that for a big tree. One is a winch 